Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I've lived in my little lakeside cottage for over 20 years now. It's nothing too fancy. Just a simple one-story home with a backyard that extends right to the shore of the lake. The best part is that section of the lake shore is part of my private property. When I first moved here, I made sure to put up signs indicating that the beach area is private property. Most folks who come to the public beach on the other side of the lake respect that and stay away. Besides, there's plenty of shoreline over there for the public to enjoy. But ever since Karen moved into the neighborhood last year, I've had nothing but trouble with her ignoring the clear, no trespassing signs, and basically using my beach as she pleases. And just last week, she really crossed the line. It was a sunny Saturday morning and I headed out to the back porch with my coffee, expecting a peaceful start to my weekend. But the minute I looked towards the shore, my relaxation turned into rage. There was Karen, casually sitting on my private beach with the fishing rod in hand. She had caught a few fish already too, based on the bucket sitting next to her. I wasn't going to stand for this blatant trespassing and theft of my lake's fish on my own property. Marching across the beach, I confronted her. Excuse me, what exactly do you think you're doing on my private beach? I asked angrily. Karen didn't even look up from recasting her fishing line. Oh, good morning, just catching some breakfast. The fish really seem to be biting this morning. Well, I don't care if the fish are jumping into your bucket themselves. This is private property, as the multiple signs clearly state, I replied. Finally, she glanced up at me, annoyed that I interrupted her illegal fishing expedition. Don't be so dramatic. This lovely beach shouldn't belong to just one person anyway. I'm just making use of this beautiful natural resource. I was flabbergasted by her audacity. The natural resource of fish in this lake do actually belong to the property owners. You are trespassing and poaching fish without permission right now, I stated emphatically. Karen fully ignored me now and went back to concentrating on fishing. Seeing she had no intention of leaving willingly, I said, If you and your ill-gotten fish dinner aren't off my beach in the next sixty seconds, I'm calling the police. That finally seemed to get through her thick skull. She let out an exasperated sigh, quickly reeled in her line, and gathered up her things. You really should learn to share, she snapped as she stomped past me back towards the street. What an unbelievable start to my morning. I was still fuming hours later. This woman's entitlement knew no bounds. I decided enough was enough. It was time to take legal action. The next week I had my lawyer draft up a sternly worded cease and desist letter informing Karen that she was forbidden from ever setting foot on my beach again without permission. I included references to the exact regulations about trespassing and poaching that she had violated. A few days later, I ran into Karen in our neighborhood park. Before I could hurry past her, she confronted me. I got your little letter. Did you really think that would intimidate me? She said scornfully. It's not meant to intimidate, just officially inform you that you are not allowed on my property, I replied calmly. You can't claim a whole beach just for yourself. I'm going to fight this, Karen declared. I shook my head in disbelief. I have the deed and legal rights. You have no case. Stay off my beach or I'll be forced to take legal action. I walked away as Karen shouted curses at me. What an immature woman, I thought. Surely she would actually listen to the letter, though, and leave me in peace. But a few weekends later, I awoke to find Karen's car parked right next to my property. Looking out back, there she was yet again. Fishing rod in hand, bucket already half full. That was it. I immediately called the police to report her trespassing. Within 15 minutes, two officers showed up. I showed them my deed and signs clearly indicating private property. They approached Karen, who was still sitting defiantly on the beach fishing. I watched with satisfaction as the cops spoke to her and she gestured wildly, clearly trying to defend her actions. But eventually, they had her pack up and leave. She shot me a nasty glare as she left the beach. A week later, I received notice that Karen was pressing charges against me for improperly barring her from the beach. Unbelievable. Luckily, facts and the law were on my side. At the hearing, Karen's claims that my beach should be public property were dismissed as baseless. The judge upheld my rights as the property owner. Karen was found guilty of trespassing and poaching. She received fines, community service, and a stern warning that if she ever trespassed on my property again, 
she would be arrested. Karen sent a few more angry letters my way, accusing me of greed and selfishness. But she thankfully never set foot on my beach again after that. Peace and quiet has been restored to my little lakeside home. I can enjoy my morning coffee on the porch without worrying about unwanted trespassers. The no fishing signs I posted seem to be working too. While dealing with Karen was a hassle, I'm glad I stood up for my rights as a property owner. The law is fortunately on the side of people who invest in and care for their land. Karen learned that she can't flagrantly violate rules and regulations without consequences. I'm just relieved I can relax and enjoy my private beach once more. The next one is a pro-revenge story. My father is the Canadian Satan. Growing up with him was less than fun, and I can assure you based on witnessing it, he was a less than fun husband. I'd go on about what a piece of crap my father is, but instead, I'll quote a judge. You're the most despicable human I've ever had in my courtroom, and that's coming from a family court judge. I read this winning endorsement of my dad's personality in the court documents I acquired related to his divorce with my mom. The same place I discovered the trickery he had engaged in to steal from my mom, it's also where I found the information I needed to get one over on him so severely he's going to disinherit me. This is a bit of a long read, so TLDR at the bottom. A frame of reference about my father is that he's a pathological narcissist and behaves exactly how those people are compelled to act. They aren't generous people, and punching them in the wallet is like a slap shot to the taint from Gretzky. He's kind of like Donkey from Shrek, but also Joseph Stalin, a monstrous jackass. Chapter 1, Hosea 3, 8 Those who sow the wind shall reap a whirlwind. Our actions always have consequences and my padre has plenty to answer for. My attempts to hold him to account didn't jump to immediate jihad. They started with diplomacy and a therapist. About ten months ago, when our tale begins, I was going through some stuff. Stuff being a whole lot of PTSD related to both my dad's abuse and my job as a paramedic. He did a ton that affected me deeply, things that I needed to move past, along with all that other razzmatazz from fifteen years of EMS. So, trying to move past and work through everything, I quit drinking, started turning my untreated PTSD into treated PTSD, and thought having my dad involved might help me and our relationship. Well, I seriously misjudged that one, so you'll probably be unsurprised to hear that the conversation went swimmingly. I'll spare you the lurid details, but when I broached the subject with him, our back and forth degenerated into visceral hate, with him screaming at me that I'm a failed paramedic, a liar, and a piece of shit alcoholic. While I have a certain pride about my job, I have more pride in my 14 months of sobriety, so hearing this from my old man might have caused me to behave a bit psychotically. I got right pissed off at him and decided to dig up every bit of dirt I could to see what kind of man he actually is and has been. When it was convenient, I hopped in the mystery machine before taking a trip to the courthouse to unleash my inner gumshoe. Everything is public record, so I bulk bought copies before retiring to my easy chair to read, plot, and pet my white long-haired cat. For good measure, I obtained a file of divorce documents from my mother. Soon enough, I hit upon a line of inquiry worth following up on. It seems that during the final settlement of my parents' divorce, 2002, my mother was awarded one-three of my father's employment pension. She was a stay-at-home mother and could not earn one herself so it was given to her by a judge. Mighty strange because my father, as he brags, took a nearly full pension and retired a bit early. No way that asshat was living the last ten years after retiring early on a 2-3 pension. He isn't constantly idioting about it. So I asked my mother if she was collecting a pension from his job or had cashed out the value, 100k plus at the time, 20 years ago. No to both questions. Well, that's interesting. I wonder if that's collectible and what 20 years of compound interest from a pension fund makes it worth. Well, I did eventually find out, along with the fact that my dear old dad had been collecting my mother's portion for 10 years in hilariously open violation of a legal order from a judge. Why didn't my mother pursue this sooner? A combination of being unable to afford a lawyer, being his victim for 20 years, and pessimism after so much of his continued dodging of obligations to the order, she just quit. There is effectively no statute of limitations he could hide behind because of the wording of the settlement. Insofar as I could tell, I had him dead to rights and my mother would be collecting. It would be a slam dunk. I just needed to hire a lawyer to help me, so I set out to find the most unbalanced, bloodthirsty psychotic who passed the bar exam. 
Chapter 2 Et tu, pension lady, as it says in the good book, screw unto others as they would screw unto you, so that's what I set out to do. The misanthropic sociopath I hired for legal counsel suggested we send a demand letter to the pension office to try and remedy it, before filing what would undoubtedly be an easy win for him. I agreed in spirit and instead phoned up the pension office and got put through to the woman managing my father's file. Well, she was a delight and it was a trivial matter for me to get her to loathe my dad. We talked for 45 minutes and I swear if you'd given me another hour, I could have convinced her to suicide bomb his house. In all our conversations about life, families, and relationships, we got down to some things of note. Since I could show her correspondence her office had sent to my father, cc'd to my mum, some years ago and ongoing for five consecutive years, trying to resolve this matter, which he had ignored, she was more than willing to start the process of remedy immediately. Full cooperation from this lady and her office was a matter of merely providing documentation, and with my lawyer on retainer, this office was beyond asking my father to comply. They complied for him. About two months since I last spoke to my father, and he now had no idea his pension was about to take a serious hit. Below, I'm going to break down how big a turd I put into his bowl of ice cream. My mother's portion was made whole and adjusted to reflect that her portion was brought to maturity and beyond, so his early retirement doesn't affect her fund. So he loses ten years of valuation to her, and he also retired three years early, which knocks him down now to seventeen years of pension valuation, not twenty-seven. If you'd forgotten, my dad had been collecting my mom's money and was overpaid by thirty cake per year for the last ten years. Like I said, mom was made whole so the pension company is going to claw back that overpayment from the base valuation of his current pension fund. I'm not exactly sure what that does to the number, but it effectively nerfs my old man's private retirement fund. He's got government old age pension that he took early, too. Whoops. My dad did some awful shit to me, but I only had to suffer 17 years of him. My mom still has the high score at 20. As much as I did this for spite and malicious glee, I did do it to give my mom a chance at a proper retirement. Chapter 3. Glitter Bombs of Justice My mother started collecting her pension about three months after I contacted the pension office, and to celebrate, she bought tickets to New Zealand for the family for Christmas so we can see our relatives. I was able to get most of my retainer from the lawyer back, and to celebrate, I went online to order a glitter bomb. I was able to ship it to my old man anonymously from another country. God bless the USA. I heard through my sister he opened it up in his stupid red Miata. Ha ha ha, he'll never get rid of it. The next one is a petty revenge story. My senior year of high school, my biological dad decided to implode our lives. Between him causing drama, my dog of 12 years passing away, wisdom teeth removal, my first period, which lasted a month and during which I was bleeding through supers in less than four hours, and doing college campus visits, I missed quite a bit of school. Some days I was so physically ill from the emotional toll, undiagnosed ADHD and depression, that I just needed a break. One of my vice principals, Mr. Rules, decided that I had missed too much school, even though my mom had called me out and all absences were approved. He caught me one day and told me that I had to attend detention unless I had a doctor's note for my absence the day before. No warning, no meeting with the truancy officer, no meeting with the school counselor. Mind you, I was maintaining a 3.8 GPA, involved in several extracurricular activities, and had a part-time job. After classes, I called my primary care office, and they agreed to write me a note. My mom had called the nurse line to see if they felt I needed to come in for an appointment when I'd been out. So they had a record of my fever and symptoms, and the doctor's recommendation to stay home. I swung by, picked up the note, and went back to school before detention started. The other vice principal, Mr. Smith, was at the desk when I got there, and the one who wanted to give me detention was elsewhere. Mr. Smith was surprised that I was there and asked if he could help. I explained everything and showed him my note. He told me he would pass along the note to Mr. Rules and advised me not to worry about the detention. On my way out the front door, Mr. Rules caught me and asked where I thought I was going, as detention was about to begin. I kindly advised him that I had just dropped off my doctor's note with Mr. Smith, who had said I didn't need to stay since I fulfilled Mr. Rule's requirement. I could see a whole range of emotions flash across Mr. Rule's face, but he begrudgingly let me go. The vein in his forehead looked ready to pop. 
I told my mom what had happened. She called the head principal. I don't know what was said. But I know that she had a conference call with someone from the school board and the school counselor. She shared the litany of things we were going through, along with my mental health state and a few other items that were happening. Mr. Rules was no longer allowed to discuss my attendance with me for the rest of the year. Even though he would glare at me or ignore me whenever we were in the same room, I also heard that he wasn't allowed to make any other decisions about attendance issues, concerns without Mr. Smith, the truancy officer, or the head principal present. They also instituted a new rule with the office staff that any questionable absences for any student had to be brought to the head principal only. As it turned out, one of the office ladies didn't like my mom or me. It was related to that whole biological dad imploding our lives. And had taken that absence to Mr. Rules specifically because she knew he would change it to unexcused. She was moved from the front office to another area and not allowed to answer the phones after that. Mr. Smith checked in with me occasionally to make sure I was doing okay, and if I needed any extra time with the school counselor. As long as I maintained my grades, my teachers had no issues with my performance and had no unexcused absences. They didn't bother me about the extra days away. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I used to be the foreman at a food distribution company with a fleet of about 100 units in total. Every quarter, there was a document inspection that essentially ensured that all the legal paperwork was in order in case DOT ever pulled a unit over. Each technician needed to be clocked in to a repair order for each job they would work on. This made it easy to track time to measure efficiency, but more importantly, how much time was spent on each unit in a certain time frame. If any unit had high labor times, it would be considered for retirement. For our quarterly inspections, I would create a generic document inspection repair order to complete all of them in one go, rather than going back and forth to clock off one and clock into another. Easy, right? The company created a position called Director of Transportation, and the person they hired had no concept of time management. We clashed quite a bit because he liked to micromanage things that didn't really matter. I could give examples, but it would make this story longer. Anyway, he insisted on making a repair order for everything, even sending an email demanding that it be done. After explaining the complexity of his request, he brushed me off as if I were a peasant. So I created a repair order for one unit, walked to the truck, checked all the paperwork, walked back, noted the work done, and closed it. I did this for every single unit on the yard. He ended up with over 100 repair orders and over 9 hours of labor to do something that usually takes about 2 hours if done all at once. I was called into his office the next day. He then wanted to write me up for insubordination. I asked to have a member from HR present. When they showed up, I showed her the email chain of what he wanted. There was nothing he could do. He literally asked me to do it that way. I left the company and the techs followed to work for me at another company. We all made sure to let them know it was because of him. Not a month later, a driver reached out and told me they fired him. The next one is an entitled people story. I just thought of this story. It happened eight or so years ago. Where I used to live, there was this small mall where on one side there was this big entranceway. The first floor had a TJ Maxx and a few small places that were always changing. The second floor had a grocery store and some always vacant space, and the third floor was a movie theater. On the other side were restaurants on the first floor and a small entranceway with an elevator that went to the back of the second floor and the movie theater. One day I was meeting my then boyfriend for a movie. The showtime was cutting it close to when I got off work, and I had a late call that got me out late so I was in a giant hurry. I worked in an office and was still dressed in a skirt suit and wearing heels trying to rush down the street so I wouldn't miss more than the previews. There had been an Applebee's in one of the restaurant spaces that had closed like six months before this incident. It was clearly closed and still looked like an Applebee's that had closed. It had all the right signage up but newspapers in the windows, and a printed paper suggesting people visit a neighboring city's Applebee's with its address. There could be no reasonable confusion that this was a former Applebee's, emphasizing former. I am running along and I see a lady getting out of a car parked on the street, and she yells at me, Excuse me, where is the Applebee's? I keep walking but say, It's closed. She starts running behind me and goes, Where is it? Take me there. I am pretty freaked out, so I just say no and keep walking. It isn't very far to the tiny elevator room, so she follows me in, and her husband boyfriend, 
I don't really know, comes in. She yells at him about how I won't tell her where the Applebee's is and something about meeting her son or daughter or something like that and how important it is. I now very awkwardly wait for the elevator. She just keeps going on talking to the guy about how she is going to speak to the manager and let them know I wouldn't take her to Applebee's. I am totally baffled. I don't work in the mall, let alone at the closed Applebee's. I am wearing business professional work clothes. She saw me walking to the building. I don't have a name tag. There is nothing that could lead her to believe I work at Applebee's. But maybe she wanted to follow me to a different job? Finally, the elevator comes, all the while she is still talking to the guy about how she can't believe I wouldn't just take her to Applebee's. It ends up being a long ride because for some reason someone had left the grocery store with bags and decided to take the up elevator instead of waiting for it to go back down. So I hear in detail about how she is going to talk to the manager. At this point, I don't even understand what she thinks is happening, but I don't want to engage. I should have just gotten off the elevator. We finally get to the movie theater and she keeps following me to the desk area. My boyfriend had left a ticket for me there. We actually saw so many movies at the time that the worker recognized me and just handed it to me. Confused lady goes, I want to speak to her manager. He, of course, goes, she doesn't work here. I am walking away, but hear her go. She wouldn't take me to Applebee's. I kind of stop walking because I want to know what is going to happen. He goes, it's closed. She literally crumpled down to the floor and screamed, this is a movie theater. I just went in, so I have no idea what she thought happened. Did she think she followed me to an Applebee's that looked like a movie theater? The best part was the guy with her never talked, just nodded along. I am sure he had long since learned not to bother. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.